All right, now we turn uh, to the purpose of an early lunch, uh, which is to have the two presentations on the stakes for Canada of <clears throat> in the Columbia River and the stakes in the United States in the Columbia River done together, and then that will be followed by a half hour discussion after you've heard both of the presentations. The presenters are both uh, internationally distinguished scholars of law, and the first one, uh, Professor Nigel Banks, uh, is chair uh, of natural resources law at the University of Calgary and also professor of law at the University of Calgary and an adjunct professor at the University of Tromso in Norway. Nigel Banks teaches courses in property law, aboriginal law, natural resources law, energy law, and gas law, as well as in environmental law, and he has written extensively on the Columbia River Treaty and the Boundary Waters Treaty. His, he's certainly among those best qualified in Canada to speak on the topic of the stakes of Canadians in the Columbia River. Please welcome Nigel Banks. Well, good afternoon and thank you both for the invitation to speak this afternoon to the White uh, uh, Museum um, and also to Henry for that uh, uh, very generous um, introduction. Um, I also want to say that standing here, of course, you look out at this beautiful view. I mean, you are all beautiful, but that is, <laughs> is, uh, is quite spectacular um, out there. Um, and therefore, it is appropriate that uh, I acknowledge, as previous speakers have, that we are also sitting here on, uh, on Treaty 7 territory, uh, specifically uh, Stona, Stony Nakoda uh, territory in this part of, uh, of Treaty 7. And let me add a couple of things to that. One is that the treaty boundary for Treaty 7 is just to the west of here. Uh, if you read the meets and bounds description in Treaty 7, it is the height of land. But notwithstanding that, we certainly know that the Stony did trade into the, uh, into the Columbia, uh, into the area above uh, of Golden. And we also know that the Picani uh, did uh, trade uh, across some of the, the passes in, uh, in southern Alberta and, uh, uh, and, and, and British Columbia. Um, I have been asked to talk about the stakes of, and I put it in speech marks, Canadians. Uh, in, the, in the Columbia River, and I think the emphasis is, is understood to be that we're going to do this in the context of the, of the Columbia River Treaty. But I think when we talk about interests of Canadians, the reality is we're talking uh, in this sort of political framework uh, about the interests of British Columbia, uh, specifically British Columbians, uh, but also, of course, uh, uh, we must talk about the interests of communities uh, within the basin, uh, and we must talk about the interests of uh, First Nations, the Tanaka people uh, in the eastern part of the, of, the, of the basin, and the Okanagan tribes in uh, the western uh, part of the basin. Um, here's the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to give you some reflections on the geography of this basin. So I thought, we better see a map pretty quick, right? Um, and remind ourselves of what the Columbia um, looks like. And then because I'm really the first of three speakers talking about the treaty, I think it's important that I say something about that uh, treaty. So why we have the treaty, that's been talked about uh, a bit this afternoon. The duration of the treaty, because there's a lot of, I think, misinformation about uh, duration. And then these two values, and it is a bivalue uh, treaty. Uh, it's concerned principally with flood control and, and power. And of course, one of the big knocks against the Columbia River Treaty is that it doesn't take a broader view uh, of ecosystem uh, values, for example. Uh, it's driven by these two engineering uh, values uh, principally. And then I'll talk about BC's Columbia River Treaty Review, which will be the vehicle that I will use for talking about the interests of Canadians, British Columbians uh, within this uh, basin. So here's a map. Um, and it's a, it's a map in a, which does a couple of things for us. I think, remember one of Charles's uh, 
earlier maps was a global map of facilities, dams. Uh, this one is uh, a map which shows the, uh, the major uh, built uh, facilities uh, within, uh, within the basin. And I guess the big message, if you haven't got it already, is that there are an awful lot of them. This is not a connected ecosystem. This is a disconnected ecosystem by big lumps of, uh, of, 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 of concrete. Um, some reminders, I think, about, uh, about geography, because in addition to the main stem of the, uh, of the Columbia, uh, obviously uh, our, the Americans are very much interested in the snake system. We won't be talking so much about the snake system uh, today. Uh, but even if we uh, go up to uh, the, the, the northern part of, of the basin, I mean, I do want to draw your attention to the, the reality that in addition to the Columbia, which, as we know, starts in Canal Flats, goes north, and then comes, and then, then comes south, um, we've also got the, the Kootenai River. Uh, and the Kootenai, of course, rises in essentially the same place, the Canal Flats uh, area of British Columbia, uh, heads south, where it's dammed by what's now the Libby uh, Dam, then heads back north up to Kootenai Lake, and then heads south again uh, out of Kootenai Lake, where it's dammed again by another, a number of Canadian facilities, uh, joining the main stem of the Columbia at Castlegar. Um, in addition to the, uh, the Kootenai, I also want to draw your attention to the, the, uh, the Pendere uh, River. So the Pendere starts in the United States, flows north into, uh, into Canada, and uh, uh, joins uh, the Columbia main stem just about Juanita, just north of the Canadian border, also dammed in both the United States and, uh, and, and, and Canada. A um, couple of other things to mention, I guess. The biggest dam on the system is Grand Coulee at that point. Grand Coulee uh, backs water up in the form of Lake Roosevelt into Canadian uh, territory. It's not part of the Columbia River Treaty. It's actually built in the 1930, late 1930s. But it is that dam which cut off escapement of salmon to the Canadian part of, of, the, uh, of, of the basin. And so with, with that um, introduction to, well, I guess the other one I should, we talked about Libby. Um, oops. Uh, Right button, yeah, thank you. Um, talked about Libby uh, a bit, but Libby is authorized by the treaty. Uh, it's that, uh, oh push dear, the bottom button? I pushed, push the, bottom the bottom button. button again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Libby is authorized by the treaty. It authorizes the construction of a reservoir which is now known as Lake Kukanusa, a compound of the Kootenai River, uh, the United States, and, uh, and Canada, and it backs up into, uh, into Canadian territory. A couple more slides on, uh, on geography. So here is uh, the Columbia Lake. Uh, close to uh, Canal Flats. And I guess what's significant about this is we did get Chinook salmon migrating all the way up to Columbia uh, lakes and spawning in what are referred to as stupendous numbers. So here were major runs of, of, of salmon uh, using this basin. And one of the things I think to reflect on is the loss of nutrients that the ecosystem uh, in that area lost as, as a result of that return of the, uh, of, of the mighty uh, Chinook. Um, one part of the basin we don't often talk about uh, is the Okanagan. The Okanagan is part of, uh, of, of the Columbia uh, River Basin. Uh, the key uh, feature of the Okanagan is that it joins the Columbia downriver of Grand Coulee. And therefore, there is still an escapement of, uh, of salmon, particularly sockeye, uh, into the Okanagan Basin uh, in, in Canada. And that, in a sense, has been one of the success uh, stories over the last number of years, although I suspect that sockeye were hit hard uh, this year, given water levels and, uh, and, and water temperatures. 
So to keep this idea, we should think about the uh, other parts of the basin uh, uh, as well as the, as the main stem. Here's a close-up of the, of the Juanita system, um, uh, of, the, of the Pendere, uh, as it joins the, uh, the Columbia. And I want, what I want you to notice about it is that the, the, uh, a particularly significant dam on the system is, uh, is Boundary Dam in the United States, which is owned by Seattle uh, City Power. Uh, that's operated principally for peaking purposes. And then two Canadian dams, Seven Mile and, uh, and, and Juanita. And a feature of uh, Juanita, which I think is significant, is it joins, it, it's really right at the confluence with the main stem of the, of the Columbia in a significant area for, for, for sturgeon, uh, a sturgeon spawning area and rearing area. So we talk a lot about salmon. Uh, but uh, one species that is hit hard by uh, any uh, hydro development is sturgeon because they need their big fish. They need to use different reaches of a river. They need different habitats within uh, a river. And so one of the issues in this part of the, of the Columbia is, uh, is, is managing the operations of hydro facilities so as not to impair any more than is already impaired that important spawning uh, habitat. <clears throat> and then equally this is just a, uh, a slide of the uh, Canadian facilities on the Kootenay below uh, Kootenay Lake and uh, above uh, Nelson. Uh, just to illustrate that uh, it's not just the main stem that's used and here was a facility that was specifically constructed by BC Hydro to take a advantage of the regulation offered by Libby uh, as a result of the, uh, of the Columbia uh, River Treaty. So that's the, that's the geography, and I think some parts of that geography that are of particular uh, interest to uh, 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 Canadians uh, and residents uh, within this area of, of, of the basin. Uh, what I now want to do is to uh, move to talk uh, about the, uh, the, the treaty. And as Henry said, I mean, this is one of the most celebrated international treaties uh, dealing with water in the world. Why? Because it provided for the cooperative development of an international river basin. The only other treaty that's talked about in the same breath is the, uh, the Indus uh, uh, River uh, Treaty, which is important for all sorts of different and maybe much more important reasons uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, irrigation uh, and a way of uh, um, bringing some level of peace to, uh, to that geographical uh, region. But why do we need this treaty? And this has been already alluded to by, uh, by Paul. Uh, small part of the basin in Canada, um, but uh, fully 30% um, of annual average flows originating uh, in Canada. Much of it, and of course this is significant in a changing climate, stored in the form of snow. I mean, one of the, the general uh, rules, I think, going forward is, in a sense, built storage will become more important, not less important, because we will not have as much storage in the form of snow uh, available uh, to us. And the particular incident that uh, uh, fueled the treaty was, of course, the, uh, uh, the 1948 um, flood. And the, the aim of the treaty was in large part to build storage in, in Canada, to level out the hydrographic uh, flow, um, to provide for the management of flows at this place called the Dalles. If you read anything about the Columbia River Treaty, you see all these references to the Dalles. The Dalles is a point of measurement uh, that's always referred to upstream from Portland. And the goal is to manage flows below the flood damaging level which is said to be 450,000 uh, uh, cubic feet uh, a second. So it's an we're talking about engineering solutions to floods uh, rather than softer uh, approaches to uh, managing the impact of, uh, of floods. And I think Barb will talk more about that uh, in her uh, presentation. <clears throat> so there's the 48 flood, uh, Vanport, Oregon, uh, uh, low income area, completely destroyed people died. Uh, trail uh, impacted. You can still see the, uh, if you go to trail, uh, there's a, uh, a 
post which indicates the, the water level uh, in and trail, and of course, all that smog is the disgusting uh, uh, smelter uh, in, uh, in, in trail operated by Cominco or its, uh, its, its successor. So what did the treaty call for? It called for Canada to build storage, and it authorized Libby. Um, so which dams were built? Uh, the smallest dam is Duncan, uh, which is um, up above um, Kootenay, Kootenay Lake. So yeah, that, there's, uh, there's Duncan Dam. Uh, what you might notice about this, this is a dam that's solely storage. It has no generation installed in it, so you can see it's, this is really built for, uh, uh, for treaty purposes. Going down the left-hand side, the most important dam in terms of flood control is, uh, is the Keenly Side uh, Dam. Um, at the bottom of uh, at the bottom of, uh, of Arrow Lakes, I should be looking at that one over there. It's easier to see. <laughs> um, so, seven million acre foot of, uh, of of storage, a relatively small amount of generation recently installed uh, in that facility. The big workhorse on the system, uh, both in terms of power generation on the Canadian side uh, and major amounts of storage, is uh, is is mica. Revelstoke is not a treaty dam, uh, but it's made possible and economic by MICA. It sits below uh, MICA and uh, runs on the basis of regulated flows uh, out of, uh, of MICA. And then Libby Dam, which I've already talked about, uh, built by the United States in the United States, uh, but backs up into, uh, uh, into Canada, but does offer some benefits to to Canada in the, in the form of downstream generation on the Kootenay, the canal plant uh, facility that I've already uh, referred to. So I said I'd talk about treaty duration, uh, first of all. And the key point to start with is that this is a system built for inertia. It has no fixed term. Uh, in other words, if neither party does anything, it will simply go on in accordance with its terms. It doesn't have a deadline. It doesn't have a 60-year life. That is a complete misnomer. However, either party has the option of giving notice to terminate after 50 years, which was September 2014. That uh, is a, uh, an ongoing 10-year notice period. Neither party has yet to give notice. Uh, the United States perhaps has the most interest in thinking about giving notice. That's a process that's underway that Barb will talk about. Termination is also, even uh, with that option in mind, also a misnomer because certain provisions of the treaty, and in particular the flood control provisions of the treaty, will continue forever. Uh, or at least for so long as those uh, Canadian treaty facilities have a useful physical life, which means until they're completely silted up. So when we talk, when people talk about termination, the key point to focus on is the only termination we're possibly talking about is termination of the power provisions of the treaty, not the flood control provisions of the treaty. Why is everyone talking about this, though? One of the most important reasons, apart from the sort of the 10-year option to renew, which we already uh, can trigger, the flood control provisions of the treaty change automatically in 2024. And I'll talk more uh, about that. So that's just built into the, the treaty. So the continued treaty under uh, any scenario uh, will have a change in the flood control uh, operation. Who actually operates the treaty? This is a treaty uh, not with BC, but between Canada uh, and, and, uh, and the United States. But who does the day-to-day -day work? Well, clearly not the feds in Ottawa uh, and in, in, in Washington. It's the two operating entities. So they're referred to as the entities, BC Hydro on the Canadian side and the Bonneville Power Administration and the US Army Corps of Engineers on the US side. So those are the guys who call the shots, make the operating decisions. And of course, these guys are engineers. That's what they think about when they, uh, they think about uh, uh, operating a, uh, a river. 
the only institution, and Barb and I, if you read that lengthy paper you've got, uh, Barb and I do think that institutions matter. Uh, and so one of the things one would say about the Columbia River Treaty it is it's institution poor, if not poverty stricken. Uh, it creates only one new institution and maybe there's a lot in a name. It's called the Permanent Engineering Board. It's not the Ecological Board. It's concerned with engineering to see that the treaty delivers on those values of uh, flood control and, uh, and, and power. Um, talking about the flood control, uh, what does the treaty say? And we have to distinguish pre-24 post-2024 for reasons that I've, I've, uh, I've just given. The treaty commits Canada, uh, having built these dams, to operate not the entire storage, but a subset of the amount of, of storage. And the most important storage is at Arrow, because it's close to the border, and it gives immediate, uh, as immediate as one can, flood control protection uh, in the United States. Uh, that Canada is obliged to operate uh, that amount of storage according to essentially plans prescribed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And that's referred to as the assured operation. In addition, the treaty provides for an on-call operation, which is that Canada can be obliged to operate any storage within the basin capable of providing uh, protection to the United States in the event that, flood con that, uh, that uh, flows reach an expected 600 kcfs at the Dalles. What was Canada paid for this? A lump sum payment of $64.4 million in 1964 dollars, we should recognize. Uh, but that was, so it was a, a fixed sum payment plus additional provision for payments for on calls, on calls which have never been made. And that tells you that the treaty has been successful. And certainly in terms of flood control, we have been able to provide the expected level of protection simply by using the assured flood control operating uh, plans. And we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that, as anyone who was living in Calgary in 2013, I think, uh, uh, can, uh, can think about and relate to, except this is a much bigger uh, system. Uh, that calculation, and I think this is important, was based on the idea of sharing the benefits. So it was more than just what's it costing <laughs> Canada, but the whole idea of coordinated development is we make the pie bigger. And then we talk about dividing that bigger pie. So the principle that informs the treaty is uh, a principle of, uh, of, of sharing benefits, sharing the enhanced size of the pie that results from coordinated rather than unilateral uh, development. Uh, Post-2024, the flood control provisions change automatically. And this is what gets people's attention <laughs> living in Portland. Uh, the United States loses the assured operation and instead has something that's now referred to as the called upon uh, operation. And uh, the United States is, uh, and the threshold is important, the trigger is important, I'll talk about that. If high flows are expected, can call upon Canada to operate uh, any available storage to provide protection, but only once the United States has established that it is adequately uh, and adequate and effective use of its own uh, facilities. So this changes the dynamics of the arrangement, I think, dramatically. The payment is essentially on the basis of full compensation rather than shared benefits on a post-2024 basis. So what are going to be the issues post-2024? What will people focus on? Well, they'll focus on what is the level of protection. What is the trigger that allows the United States to, to make the call? And there is an ongoing debate about whether this is 450 KCFS or whether it's uh, 600 KCFS. No one, I think, has a clear answer to that question. Second, what do we mean by all related storage? One view is this is any storage within the basin, anywhere in the basin, 
uh, starting in Idaho and moving down the, uh, both the Snake and the Columbia system that's capable of providing a measure of flood control protection. Now, if that's right, that will dramatically change the operation of all sorts of, of U.S. facilities that perhaps were constructed principally for irrigation purposes. The United States, I think, will say, no, it's a much more limited uh, obligation that we have, and it's confined to the dams that were specifically licensed for flood control as one of their dominant uh, purposes. But that would include Grand Coulee, for sure, and it might have significant consequences for the way in which the United States uh, would be required to operate Grand Coulee. Um, what do we mean by effective use? Um, is, eff is effective use constrained only by the physical uh, configurations of these dams, the size of the outlet flows and, and, and things like that, and obviously safety considerations? Or are there environmental considerations that can be built into and would limit that obligation of effective use? And then the procedure. How is all this going to work? You don't provide flood control instantaneously, right? You, you must be months in ahead looking at flows into the reservoir, the in the reservoirs, the forecast of precipitation over the balance of uh, the, uh, uh, the melt season. And, and so you've got to make decisions way in advance as to when you're going to uh, uh, draw down reservoirs for, uh, for storage purposes. So the whole procedure... The treaty's pretty good on the assured operation because we've been doing it for 50 years. This is, in a sense, the unknown, and the unknown is really scary when you're talking about flood control. The power provisions. Only five minutes. But remember, I'm doing two things here. I'm introducing the treaty for everybody. And, but, okay. I, <laughs> If you could give me 10, and Bob and I have talked about this, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing double duty for us here. Um, the power provisions. Um, so Canada agrees to operate a, a significant amount of storage at these three built facilities according to a prescribed power plan which is designed to optimize generation at Canadian facilities and downstream uh, American uh, facilities. It's based upon something called an assured operating plan. I'm not going to get into the details. The crucial point, that the benefit to Canada, is that the effect of this storage upstream, which levels out the hydrograph, is that you firm up capacity at downstream main stem dams in the United States, and you can also generate additional energy. They're two different uh, benefits, but the deal was share the benefits, 50-50. So Canada gets 50% of, of that incremental generation and incremental uh, capacity. And that calculation is made not on the basis, and this is a crucial point, not on the basis of actual generation, but it's a theoretical calculation, meaning that we simply assume that these facilities are going to be operated to maximize power generation, and the sharing is on that assumed generation and calculation. Canada pre-sold the entitlement uh, in, um, in 1964 for 30 years for a lump sum. Remember, this is Mr. Bennett, who maybe is the author of uh, every drop of water has got to do its duty. Uh, this is Mr. Bennett, who is the Premier of uh, British Columbia, who also wanted to simultaneously uh, develop the, uh, the peace. Needed the money to do that. The way to get that money was to pre-sell the uh, Canadian downstream power entitlement for 30 years. After 30 years, those facilities, or the, the, the incremental power, came back to, uh, to Canada, either to sell into the United States or delivered back into Canada. And it's, it's currently, it's continuing to come back. And the annual value of that varies a little depending on power markets, is about $200 million uh, uh, a year. So it's not an insignificant amount of, uh, of, of money. Um, what are the power issues uh, on a go forward basis? Uh, and the principal issue is this, this assumed calculation because the reality is 
these dams in the United States are not operated uh, to maximize power. They're not operated to maximize power because of so-called biops. These are biological opinions issued under the terms of the Endangered Species Act to protect listed species, including uh, salmon uh, and sturgeon, which says we need biological flows, effectively, uh, rather than uh, power flows. So the result is that, certainly from the United States' perspective, certainly from the perspective of some of these dam owners who include utility districts in the, the so-called mid uh, Columbia area are paying more than they think they should. So moving on now to uh, um, sort of well, where's BC sitting uh, in all of this? Where are BC residents? Where are uh, Basin residents uh, uh, sitting? So a crucial point, this is a BC-driven process. Canada is deferential. Why? Constitutionally, uh, these resor this resource is owned by the province rather than uh, the federal government. BC launched a, a, a treaty review process uh, a few years ago uh, and issued its decision uh, in March 2014, and it has uh, 14 elements. There's a pretty good website that the BC government maintains, and you can see a number of uh, background documents uh, on that website, including a collection of views solicited from uh, uh, residents in the basin, studies of uh, what different flow regimes might look like in a treaty continue versus a treaty terminate situation. How might you operate Arrow, for example, differently if you're not constrained by uh, the, uh, the, the, the treaty. But 14 elements to uh, um, the, uh, the, the BC position, and I'll go through these uh, uh, reasonably uh, uh, quickly, but we can certainly come back to them uh, in the discussion. So maximize benefits to both countries through coordination. So the idea here, again, is increasing the size of the, of, of, of the pie. Will coordination deliver enhanced benefits? If it won't, why bother coordinating, I think, is part of the, the, the philosophy there. Uh, BC says, and residents of the region certainly say, there are ongoing impacts from these dams uh, and the construction uh, that uh, we would like to see some compensation for. These impacts include the implications of drawing down these facilities on an annual basis for, and a more than annual basis for power and flood control purposes. Not only is that unsightly, uh, it causes health problems because of dust issues. It causes transportation issues because of uh, uh, lower <coughs> reservoir values. It causes recreational issues because you can't get your boats onto the, uh, the reservoir. It causes fisheries issues because fish don't have access to their spawning streams. So transportation issues because these reservoirs bisect what is naturally a west-east transportation uh, corridor. So a, a whole bunch of continuing impacts. So BC would say, got to keep those in, uh, in, in consideration. Um, benefits from coordinated benefits should be shared equitably. So the idea here, again, I think is the principle underlying the treaty is sharing benefits. Let's keep that front and center. Certainty on the one hand is good because we need to may build and, and uh, keep investing in these facilities but the reference as well to adaptation. I guess that was what Paul, I think, left us with, the importance of uh, adaptation on a go-forward basis because of changes in power markets, changes in, uh, uh, in, in, in climate and uh, precipitation forms. Um, some very specific provisions. No called upon operation without effective use. So that's just the idea that Yes, post-2024, the principal obligation is actually an obligation on the United States to make effective use of its own facilities before calling on us to provide for flood control. Uh, coordinated flood risk management should extend to U.S. reservoirs. So the flood control operating plan is actually a plan, U.S. authored, is actually a plan for Canadian facilities. So Canada is saying we need a more coordinated flood control operating plan for the, uh, the basin. 
maybe a bit more contentious, the parties already apply ecosystem values and will continue to do so. So the core of this is, yes, we've got these two values, power and flood control, and this assured operating approach, but within that we can agree each year in the form of supplementary operating plans and, uh, uh, and, and fisheries plans to provide for uh, specific flow arrangements which will allow for fish flows into the, into the United States, uh, uh, minimum flows out of uh, arrow for whitefish spawning, a whole bunch of other values can be taken into account at the margins. So what BC is saying, we're already doing that, we should do uh, more of that, both inside the treaty and outside uh, the, uh, the, the, the treaty. Uh, keep in mind that there are domestic limits on the way in which we operate our facilities. BC Hydro, in theory, is just as subject to the, uh, to the terms of the Fisheries Act and the protection of fish habitat as any other entity in, uh, in, in Canada. Canada and residents uh, in the Kootenai system are certainly interested in the way in which Libby is operated. Uh, Kukanusa is crucial for recreational interests uh, the on the level of Kukanusa is crucial for recreational interests on that, uh, on that reservoir. BC and those residents would like to see um, um, more coordination, uh, more taking into account of Canadian interests in the way in which Kukanusa is uh, uh, operated. Um, here's a tough one to, uh, to, to swallow. What about salmon? So First Nations certainly take the view that the long-term goal for uh, um, the Columbia must be the restoration of salmon through the entire uh, system. What's BC's position on that? The big problem ain't the Columbia River Treaty, it's Grand Coulee, as we've already talked about. That's a U.S. facility. If we're talking about salmon bypass uh, operations, that's a U.S. Uh, obligation. Climate change should be incorporated, um, but still in light of power and flood control, no doubt. First Nations and communities must be engaged, and a whole bunch of non-treaty issues we should address outside the treaty. So the general message here, and I will flip to my, well, I'll try and get there, um, the last slide, the conclusion. I think the basic message of BC's position is it's an incremental approach. So once we've heard from Barb, I think you'll see that there are actually significant differences between the US position as we know it and the BC uh, position. The key ideas informing BC's position are we've already got this infrastructure. We're not talking about taking out these major dams. Uh, the crucial uh, idea is maintaining the benefits of uh, the treaty. Uh, Key to those benefits is the idea of sharing uh, uh, the benefits to the extent that coordination results in enhanced uh, benefits. Don't overburden the treaty with um, uh, non-power and flood control issues. Don't try and insert uh, ecological values into the treaty text. If we do, we'll never reach consensus, I think would be the blunt way of, uh, of BC uh, putting it, but we should pursue those other values outside the treaty in other forum, and maybe even a separate treaty uh, dealing with those, uh, some of those issues. But the key idea, I think, is let's proceed incrementally rather than um, dramatically changing the treaty. I was going to say blowing up the treaty, but that would be <laughs> way too... Uh, 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 let's proceed incrementally. Okay, thank you very much. And, So now we'll move uh, directly to the presentation on the stakes of Americans in the Columbia River by Professor Barbara Cousins, who is Professor law of Law at the University of Idaho. Her research interests include the integration of law and science and education, water governance and dispute resolution, adaptive water governance and resilience, and the recognition and settlement of Native American water rights. 
Barbara is a member of the university's consortium on the Columbia River Go Governance. And here again, she's one of the people south of the border, one of the lawyers south of the border, one of the legal scholars south of the border, who is best uh, qualified to lay out for us the stakes of Americans in the Columbia River. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cousins. <laughs>